Folks, we're here in Provincetown, interview number two with producer Frank Durant, who created the Amazing Lady of the Dunes documentary. You've heard me talk about the documentary, my book, a ton on the podcast. We figured with all the recent news and events that have come up in the last month, two months, it'd be good to do a follow-up interview and also visit the drop site of the Lady of the Dunes, Ruth Marie Terry. So, obviously a lot has changed since that interview in March. Most specifically, the Lady of the Dunes is no longer a mystery. She's been identified as Ruth Marie Terry. So I guess my big question is, how did you hear about the announcement, and what was your initial reaction? Um, I was at work. I got a call from Stephen the Medium around 8.30 that he received a Twitter uh, feed stating that there will be a news conference about the longest unsolved murder mystery being solved, having the identity more to come later and then within an hour people kept asking the question this has to be Lady of the Dunes so NBC and CBS kept changing the news feed every 30 seconds to include that it is the Lady of the Dunes so it was uh, kind of a shock because we were all kind of being prepared for Halloween and we thought really I don't know of all days Halloween they're gonna this is happening but we were beyond thrilled it was very surreal because we thought this day would never come yeah it was wild I just remember being on my way to get new tires and you calling, sending texts, saying that this was happening. And it was kind of like, are you serious? Of all days, Halloween. Obviously, with the name Ruth Marie Terry, what did you think of that? Did anything that came out with the press conference with the FBI news release, did it sound like anything familiar or was it all kind of out of left field? Well, the only thing in left field was she was a mother, a, a wife and a mother, because we all thought that, you know, if who was she last seen with? And everybody's made that question. Once you find out who she was last seen with, we'll know exactly who her murderer was. But to find out that she had a huge family, we were shocked it, it took this long for the DNA to match up because the Terry family, there are hundreds of people down in Tennessee. It's, it's a large family. So it wasn't like she was from a very small, unknown she, 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 she had quite abundance of bloodlines connected to her, so it was almost an, an easy, once they, once they were able to match that DNA up and get a name, everything started to fall into place. That's right, so the fact is she actually had family that had been looking for her, right? For what I was told, yes, I guess in 1974 there was a, a missing persons uh, report made by the Terry family, and um, everything on that police report matched up to what was in the public information of her height, weight, and everything about that. Okay, so without naming names, obviously, you know, has anyone from the documentary that was either in it or helped behind the scenes, have they reached out to you since the Lady of the Dunes was revealed to be Ruth Marie Terry? Yes. <laughs> Did anyone say anything about how the documentary might have influenced law enforcement or pushed forward getting her identified? Yes. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm proud of the movie, period. I, I talked to my, mo all three of my producers, all my investors, crew members, we all stand by and believe in the movie that we produced, period. And pride's a sin, but we agree with everything that we said in the documentary. And we will admit, we got some stuff wrong. But we got a lot of things right, and we brought a lot of new insight to the public's attention. And whether it was the movie or the research that led to the movie, because we made at least a 1,000 phone calls. We talked to a lot of people in forensic, law enforcement, federal, state, local level. Talked to a lot of people who were players in this, from, from journalists, historians, people who just knew people. So before we even yelled action in April of 2021, we collectively pissed off some good people, powerful people, and if that's what did it, if that's what helped push or light the fire, as opposed to when we premiered this in April of 2022, we know for a fact a lot of people in law enforcement came to the free premieres in Dennis and Provincetown, and this is six months before her identity came to, came to be. So will we get the credit? Probably not, but at the end of the day, we're proud of what we did and what we set out to accomplish. We did it. 
We're, so we're out in the dunes right now where her body was found. We're standing where the body was found. So what do you think this site where she was found says about her killer or killers? Like, you know, as far as their relationship to her. Well, it's definitely not a random site because if you decide to take a walk out here, there's literally a thousand other places to dispose of a body. Uh, this is not random. It's actually quite specific to where the old intersection was, to the Dune Shack Road. And whoever came out here must have known of the place because you're literally in the backyard of where the seascape used to be before you get to house two, which I believe is the Adams house, or three or four. So to get out here is a challenge. So I truly feel this is a drop site. I believe she was murdered someplace else. And whoever knew of this area knew that they won't find her body for weeks, if not months. It's interesting because standing here, like you can see a couple of dune shacks, but yet it's still, it's so secluded. It's, you would have to know this area to get out to here. Cause just, I can tell you just walking out here, it was quite a hike. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, south of here is the campgrounds. So if I was to dispose a body, that body would be found within a day. If I chose the east pot, I'd be back where the old parking lot was for the public hiking up to the dunes, and the body would be found sooner than later. And organized crime knew that all the drugs was coming in from the west pot of race point. So whoever dropped her here knew about those three locations. This was not random. They had the four-wheel cap capability of a Jeep, which I was told that Guy Moldovan had a uh, international Jeeper, I think they were called. But then again, unless he knew how to drive out of these roads, and he would need needed help, out here, so I'm pretty sure this location, he'd been out here before, or the person with him knew about this location. So, we had, you actually just brought it up. Now that Ruth Marie Terry has been identified, you know, that was our whole thing, the documentary and with the book, was to give her her name back. Mm -hmm. So now she's got her name, so it kind of turns to who killed her and why she ended up out here. So... Do you think that, you mentioned Guy Moldovan that was her last husband. What do you think, is anything else going to come out about her? I hope so, but to defend law enforcement, they gave her name back and they tied everything to this, this guy, Moldovan. So to answer the question why is just window dressing to the people who have been really involved with this, this person's case. I, I feel honestly giving her name back, her identity, bringing her back to the family is, is more than justice. And her murderer is, is obviously dead. But to really, I, I hope so. But at the end of the day, I, I feel that we're kind of closing the, the last chapter of her story. So we actually just came from the grave site and she now has a stone with her name on it and it's kind of, I mean, we're doing this for closure, but it was kind of surreal knowing where this all started, where she was this Jane Doe for almost 50 years and now we go to her cemetery to the grave for maybe the last time and she's actually got a name. Well, she has a son. And I was told that the son one day is going to visit his mom's grave. And I'm very grateful that the people of Provincetown have left mementos. They've left flowers, uh, seashells, a rock, coins. They've left something behind just to remind anybody who comes to visit her that people in this community wanted to keep her memory alive. That's love. Whether you're a local journalist, local law enforcement, local podcaster, People have not exploited, but they've kept her memory alive for this day to, to come. So I, along with you, Christopher, we brought sand from where her body was found, and we placed it at her gravestone. And, you know, sand, for the test of time, will probably won't, won't be there in a couple of days, but we were there today. We said our goodbyes. We said how grateful we were. We also stopped by the grave of Leslie Metcalf and Chief James Meads to say thank you. And for resolution or closure I believe today we received it I agree I totally agree this this whole journey has been just for me growing up on Cape Cod growing up with the Lady of the Dunes mystery if you had told me when I was a teenager that I'd be even slightly involved with her getting her name back I just there's no way but you know as we kind of get 
done with Provincetown and leave that behind and leave the Lady of the Dunes behind, at least in the documentary. I'm still working on the book and getting that published. But after her identity reveal now, how has this project, the Lady of the Dunes documentary, been different for you than others that you've done? Um, it shows the power of filmmaking. You know, I, I, I started this with the goal of making a murder mystery series. When I, when I met with the investors, I assumed they wanted to hire me to do a feature, a feature project or commercial something. And when they when they sprung this on me, I thought, okay, uh, it's, it's where my talents need the, the needs of the world. You know, that's that's the ego talking. But I truly felt like they they called on me, they commissioned me to produce this documentary. So I felt okay, this isn't just doing a fun movie for, for giggles. This isn't doing something just to put a few dollars in my pocket. This is something where they want me to affect this case. They want me to try to bring her identity to light. And out of everything I've done in the last 20 years, yes, it's probably the most important film-related project I've been involved in. I'm, I'm proud of having spent the last two years investigating, producing, and making the documentary and coming to... Um, this, this fine award, rewarded uh, resolution. I agree. When it comes to all of my work I've done in writing and such like that, this has been the most important project of my career, so I'm totally in agreement with that. And as far as the film itself, where are people going to be able to see it? Because now the time has come when people are actually going to be able to see it outside of a theater setting. Well, if you visit her grave, I left a DVD copy there for someone to hopefully see it, take it with them, watch it, and then pass it on to someone else who wants to watch it as well. Uh, local libraries through the Cape Cod Network will receive free copies in their library directory. We, we should have a free screening through social media, whether it's Vimeo or YouTube. And um, Alpha New Cinema, which owns oldies.com, they work with Allied Vaughn, they're releasing it the first of the month of uh, 2023. So there'll be different ways to... Watch the documentary either, either through online or uh, through DVD. So I hope uh, if there is interest of watching what we did, uh, enjoy. So with all that said and done, kind of what's the next step? What's the next chapter as we go, not necessarily just in The Lady of the Dunes, but in general, like where, where do we go from here? Well, first, I can't wait to read the book. When this book comes out of yours... Um, everybody who's interested in the documentary, if not just the subject matter, is, is waiting for this book to see the light of day. So I can't wait to read about what I did and who I am in this book, <laughs> whether it's a murder mystery or fiction or what have you. So I can't wait to read that. But at the same time, um, the phone rang two years ago, and I was asked to do this. So I think I'm on the path where I'm waiting for that phone to ring. So if there's another Cape Cod project, whether it be feature film or documentary, I'm, I'm going to wait for that phone to ring. There you go. So people that are listening to this interview, if you've got an idea, reach out to us. If you see the Lady of the Dunes documentary, if you read the book, it's it's great stuff and it's a true story. And never in my wildest dreams did I think that I'd be a part of even a little bit of a resolution to the case. So that's all thanks to you, Frank. I mean, I never would have thought I'd be involved in something like this. Uh, it's been a good, uh, it's, it's been a wild trip, Chris, so I would do it again in a heartbeat. Yeah, and as we say that, we're going to sign off with this interview as we now go to Pine Grove Cemetery to pay one last visit to the uh, Tony Costa site. So it's it's over, but it's not over.